knew it was a certain risk to have a public seminar on the Friday afternoon of the start of the party, the start of the big holiday season in Cape Town. So we don't have a huge hall, but we, have, we will have lots of opportunity to engage with the people who are here. Thanks particularly to all of our country men. Special welcome to you. I can understand you didn't want to miss the opportunity. We had already this morning the formal award ceremony as part of our UWC graduation in the Great Hall. It was a very full and very noisy and very <laughs> celebratory <laughs> event. Um, and then he spoke very briefly there. So um, this is much more hearing about what's happening in Ethiopia and so on and, and engaging with each other. Um, so welcome to everybody who's here. Under normal circumstances, um, Jake, we don't need some of the media, um, but they are traveling at the moment, so can't be here. So the travel family is presented by Dr. Daniel, who is a UWC student himself uh, and a nephew of Jake's. So welcome to you as well. And welcome to the Anna, and of course, welcome to our most honored guest, the Minister of Health of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. Um, so what we're going to do is, this afternoon, we are going to have, we are, I've asked Jaffa to speak briefly about, a little bit about Jake's Carvel, who the award is, is named after, the award is named after, um, why he's going to come out. He was the rector of the university when the public health program was first established under David Sanders' leadership. And I joined him soon afterwards, and that's a very long time ago. <laughs> As you can see from both of our slightly wrinkled faces. Um, and then Diana Yak from the Bauberger Foundation won this award. And we'll talk a little bit about um, why this award and what Malberg, uh, what connection Malberg has with its helping and family. Please come in. And then we've asked Walder Kidan to introduce Amir to us. Um, Walter is firstly a countryman, although he is now, we now claim him as one of our own because he's been here a very long time. And he's a staff member, has been working with me for many years, and very much part of the establishment of the School of Public Health. And very importantly, he managed, coordinated, project coordinated the project that Amir was a student under, um, and the project he graduated from. So I thought it would be just right for him to introduce his compatriot. So that's what we'll do. So I'll start with um, Jaffrey to talk a little bit about Jake's and what he did to public health. Thank you. Thank you. Can I stand behind you? Oh. You can stand behind the I don't think I need the mic, but I just want to lean on you in case I fight. <laughs> I don't. Can everybody hear me without the mic? <coughs> oh, do you need to record? Okay. Okay, so good afternoon.
fully comprehend the magnitude of the contribution um, that man could actually make, be it in the political sphere, in the personal sphere, the academic sphere, or the global context. And the reason for that is we never spoke about those things then. We just spoke about the human engagement in the personal, how is life going? And the other day, uh, my mommy called me and she said, you know what, I'm very sad about Uncle Jake, I'm very sad about Mimi and all the other siblings that passed on. But she said what she can say that she's very grateful for is the love that they felt. And that's a love that all the cousins felt for all our uncles and aunties. And why that's important for, for what I consider to be important for the School of Public Health, if I if I look at the, the vision and the purpose, we're moving towards a shift from a robotic type of behavior with our patient. There's the emotional context that we take into account when engaging with the, with the health system. And what I've learned from Uncle Jake's is that for human beings before we anything else, he's always extended that interpersonal relationship, irrespective as to what it is you did, what your title was, or your contribution. He had a real organic systems thinking approach to, to his decision making. And he engaged each and every individual exactly the same. So I used to hear stories about him walking around on UWC and spending time speaking to the gardener just as much time as you would spend speaking to any other way. But what I also think is important to note is where my uncle comes from. And he comes from, we all know the Eastern Cape on a farm, but I think the emotional observation that my uncle was exposed to was a great father. My grandfather was an exceptional man. He had a clear vision in terms of where he wanted his children to be. And what is great about Uncle Jake's in the School of Public Health is that my grandfather did not confine that to his children. He extended that to all the farm workers' children. So when the system did not engage and did not consult and said there's no schools for your children, he went to involve the school. So he did everything in his capacity to enable social mobility. So Uncle Jace was exposed to that, and he comes from that greatness. So he might identify the need for a district health system, a primary health care approach, a district health management team. All comes, I think, comes from that greatness of wanting to contribute to the greater population. And if you look at the, the vision of the School of Public Health, um, wanting to contribute to an optimal health of the population in a safe and sustainable environment, I think that the, the interpersonal relations that Uncle Jake showcased um, during his life is imperative in that. And in terms of the purpose, one thing that stands out to me is uh, the practice being influenced by an active community. And that was absent back then. And Uncle Jake was somebody who remained connected to the community. He came from the farm, came to Cape Flats, where he stayed with all the options to move if he could. But he stayed in Milan, and he stayed connected to the community. And I think that is, um, that was really a, that was illustrated in how he carried himself. I engaged with people, consulted, and listened to, to the voices. What I will tell you, um, Amir, is that uh, your, the significance you made in child health and um, human resource development, my uncle had a distinct love for children. He adored children as much as he enjoyed naughtiness too. Um, so I think it's quite fitting that you're getting this over with that type of progression. So 
I think in conclusion, there were things that didn't exist on the farm when our parents were there. Like my mother broke her arm on a Friday, she only went to the hospital a day or two later in terms of access to this district health system. And I think looking at my uncle here, just like my grandfather, he did everything he could do and he didn't confine his energy to himself and the family. Um, that was the only way that he could. Um, so congratulations to you. Um, you should know the best. That's what he's thinking. So he said then, a health service is required to perceive the priority problems and to target resources to deal with these problems in the most effective way. Such a service needs an adequate supply of capable training different from any provided in our training institutions to date. It is something that Amir could have said as well. Um, he said that in 1991, and with that in mind, he set forth to Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to join you this afternoon in this very special meeting. Um, I also always, when I come to UWC, appreciate the chance it gives me to reconnect with some very special old friends, not meaning old, but long-standing friends, <laughs> and also to make new ones. Um, and my mother, Estelle Yach, who is now 88, sends her very special love and affection to everybody at this gathering. She's
she's always in, in my head, even if she's not here in person. Um, and she's very keen for me to report back on how today's events went. Um, I just wanted to say that I was blown away um, and inspired by today's graduation ceremony, which I witnessed. And I felt that it was such a joyous occasion um, and one where so many diverse, young, enthusiastic, and not so young graduates um, embarked on their first steps in whatever career they are hoping to go into related to, to the health sector. Um, and I was just thinking how proud my grandfather, Morris Moorberger, would be if he knew so many fantastic ethical leaders were being supported, nurtured, and grown at UWC because he had a very strong affection for UWC, particularly as it was during apartheid, it was at the forefront of the change agenda. Um, and he was somebody who was very committed to growing young people. Um, and ensuring that they felt very much part of their own community and the wider South Africa. And I think he'd be very proud today, if he was around, um, to actually see the growth and the change, particularly in the School of Public Health. Um, I just wanted, for those of you who, who don't know me or, or the Foundation Fund, um, just to share a few thoughts, and I won't take very long, but just to reflect on how our relationship, me as chair of the Fund Morberger Foundation Fund, began. Um, and it started in 1975 when my grandfather uh, was committed to establishing uh, bursaries for dental students um, at UWC during Dick van der Ross's uh, term of office. And over the years, um, our relationship broadened and strengthened with UWC um, when Jake Gerwell became a director of the Morberger Foundation Fund. Um, and he was instrumental in influencing us to, to actually broaden our horizons and particularly reflect on vision, the need for visionary leaders in healthcare. Um, and at the time, when Jakes was uh, rector of UWC, um, very few uh, institutions of higher learning had a focus on schools of public health. So he was really a pioneer in, in supporting the initiatives. <coughs> um, and of course, when he brought in Dave, Professor David Sanders, um, I think we were even more excited um, to support future programs. Um, I too have a very warm feeling towards, the, in, towards this institution because of my involvement in the lead up to the elections in 1994 as a Brit wearing a Commonwealth Observer jumper. Um, I actually helped to facilitate as a European Commonwealth Observer, uh, as a Commonwealth Observer, um, in Kailicha and Nyanga and Langa and Mitchell's Plain. Um, and I remember sneaking down to Stranford team and taking off my jumper and voting for Nelson Mandela. And to me, that was incredibly important and exciting. Um, I also helped to develop peace monitors and uh, marshals. And in order to do that, we connected with people from all over the continent. Um, because what we didn't want was just to have a cohort of white British officers coming over. Um, we wanted to actually share experiences in the peace movement and also in um, martial training to steward the elections with colleagues from Africa. So, very, that was a real treat and a real privilege to be part of that time. But when you were talking, um, we shared a lot in common because my grandfather, J. 
Jakes's father, always believed in supporting people beyond the family, the immediate family. And I think it's part of the ethics of Judaism as well, that we, we don't just think of ourselves, but we actually think about the stranger um, and think about the wider community, because if we're okay, um, that's fine. But if other people nearby aren't okay, that's not fine. And so my grandfather came, when he came as an immigrant from Lithuania, um, with very little, apart from his bar mitzvah suit, and he couldn't speak English. Um, he, he slowly but surely, through hard work and endeavor, and no formal education, um, managed to, to build a, a, a large business. And at one point he turned around and he said to his family, you've got enough, now we're giving everything else to the foundation fund. Um, and his first um, philanthropic um, investment was actually establishing a, a clinic in Ottery in 1936, similar to your grandfather, recognizing that it's all very well to have factories in Cape Flats, but if we don't have healthy workers, um, you know, where, who are we and what are we? And so he invested in the building, but most important, the human aspects. So the social workers, the occupational therapists, the doctors, um, and the operating theaters. Um, so again, with a focus on humanity, um, when Grandpa passed on, my father led the foundation fund, and then my mother, and I was handed over the baton um, five years ago when I returned to South Africa. Um, and I've recommitted myself to ensuring that we continue the journey to grow ethical leaders, um, and with a special focus on growing African collaborative um, leaders who are willing to share experiences and their learning with each other um, on the basis that we're not alone. You know, there are always new ideas elsewhere and we can always learn from each other. And why should we always learn as Africans from America or Europe um, when so much good is going on in the South? So our foundation fund encourages those kinds of academic collaborations. Um, and we support students, postgraduates, clinical scholars at UCT. We support the program in public health at UWC. And we also have bursaries at the CPUT. Um, and beyond that, we, we support programs in Ramallah for Palestinian physicians. Uh, to upskill themselves in particular emergency medicine and other specialist areas which they can't get in the West Bank. We also support programs for Bedouin women um, in social work, teaching, law, medicine um, at Ben Gurion University because very often these are the, the first women in their family that has actually got an education. And that enables them to access healthcare state benefits, which otherwise they would not be able to um, attract. So I don't want to, to, to dwell on that, but I just think that most of our work um, is inspired very much by the young people and the efforts that they put into building a better world. Um, and I'm always energized uh, when I meet up with um, people who are exploring sometimes wacky ideas. I mean, donors don't always fund projects that work perfectly. <laughs> sometimes things don't go the way you want. But I think you've got to have a forward focus. You've also got to be willing to focus on needs, not on fame. And I think you must have humility because we can always learn something else. There's always another way of doing things that we take a long-term view. So um, we're very willing to embrace unpopular, or champion unpopular causes because they're the right thing to do, and to stand up and be counted. 
rather than just tick boxes and say we're doing X, Y, or Z. Um, so I, I do think that for me, we all live in a, a global village. We all need to understand each other better. Um, I think Jake's was an exemplar of um, the ethical leader in practice. And that's why the Foundation Fund was so thrilled when we talked to, um, I think it was Brian O'Connell at the time, um, to actually, and also David Sanders, to think about how could we honor Jake's Gowell, and of course talking to Phoebe and the family. Um, and we felt that this would be a fitting memorial and legacy, um, even if it's a small one, in making great things happen. And I think we've seen from Amir's um, brief presentation at the graduation ceremony what an amazing um, impact he's having. Um, and I'm very proud that he started life at UWC, he wasn't start, but completed his journey, uh, um, certainly in the early stages at UWC. So I feel very much part of that journey. Thank you very much indeed. Dr. Amir Aman, uh, he is Minister of Health of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, and he was born uh, in Baharda, the capital city of the Amhara region, uh, and he spent most part of his young life in the city. And after a perfect matrix call, he moved to the country's capital, Addis Ababa, uh, to pursue his tertiary education, and he studied medicine at Addis Ababa University Black Lion Hospital. And in his first uh, year at the university, studying medicine was not in his radar. He was hell-bent to become one of the 20 students to be accepted to study computer engineering, uh, which was a dream of his since his high school days. However, an unsatisfactory result in one of his tastes in physics, uh, which is a core subject for engineering aspirants, made him reassess his future in computer engineering. Amir seized uh, an opportunity to immediately request a transfer, uh, and medicine became the most plausible option uh, at the time. <coughs> Interesting enough, uh, his physics final grade that year was an A+. Plus. Uh, Amir says, I chose medicine under those circumstances, but in hindsight, it was the best choice. Sometimes you find your life calling under mysterious circumstances. Even though studying computer engineering was my dream, uh, I look at my decision to study medicine positively. He considers his older brother, Saeed Aman, as his role model. And uh, from him, he learned uh, that for me, sense of optimism and the importance of having a big picture perspective. Uh, professionally, Amir considers Dr. Tedros Akano, uh, who is the current Director General of World Health Organization, his primary role model. Uh, and he had the opportunity to work with Dr. Tedros when the latter was the country's health minister. He said, 
I'm your safe. Dr. Tedros has influenced me in many ways, and I learned from him a deep appreciation for humility, uh, knowledge, team spirit, uh, and empowering others. Dr. Ami also credits his mother, uh, Sophia Hashi, for instilling in him during his young days that in knowledge lies the most important power. And Amir says he is forever indebted to his sister and mother for all the sacrifices they have made together this far. And it was always his ambition to contribute and make a difference as a professional. And upon completing his medical training in 2009, and prior to his deployment to carry out his mandatory two-year service, the Ministry of Health, uh, which was then under the leadership of Dr. Tedros, organized the first, for the first time, a three-week engagement focusing on the country's health policy and strategies, topics uh, that were hardly covered in the medical curriculum at the time. Amir thinks those three weeks gave him a great deal of insight about the state of the nation policies and strategies of the health and other sectors, and the magnitude of the challenges and expectations ahead. In medical school, uh, Amir said, we were so invested in our clinical training, you hardly know anything else. We don't even know whereabouts of the Ministry of Health. Previous, previously, the practice was that graduates are randomly assigned to their mandatory post, and they are expected to practice for a given period without any engagement with the Ministry of Health. And after completing his medical training in 2009, Dr. Amir started his professional career as a physician in one of the worst performing and poorly resourced hospital in a remote part of Ethiopia, which he continued to serve as director for two years. He transformed the hospital into a model hospital for the rest of the country through introducing pioneer governance and accountability systems, mobilizing community, and promoting patient-centered care and primary health care. When Dr. Amir registered for a Master's of Public Health in 2011 at UWC, he was a young 25-year-old hospital director. He says of his studies at UWC, the experience made me rethink everything through his studies and the research he did for a thesis on how to retain community health workers, Dr. Amir recognized he could have a far greater impact on health of all Ethiopians than he was achieving as a hospital director. And he requested a transfer to the Ministry of Health Human Resource Department and in short order rose from Director of Human Resource Development in 2011 to Director General of Planning, Policy and Finance in 2012, State Minister in 2013, and to Health Minister of the Federal Republic of uh, Democratic Republic of Ethiopia since May this year. Dr. Amir explained in a recent interview that he sees his rise in power not as an entitlement, but opportunity to serve towards wider impact. He said, I'm humbled by my appointment to serve and lead our health sector. It's a court duty to ensure the health of our people. Indeed, as the adage aptly states, health is wealth, uh, because a healthy society is a productive society. That's why we view our mission to provide universal health care that's quality, accessible, affordable, and equitable is fundamentally a human right and uh, a non-negotiable moral. Under his leadership, the health sector has seen many significant successes, particularly in the area of maternal and child health and human resource development, uh, the latter his area of specialization at UWC. Dr. Amir has continued to champion and inspire the new generation of health professionals through dedicated public service. His leadership in increasing the quality and volume of medical services and task shifting have been profiled as a model of public service nationally and internationally. He has also made major contributions towards the planning, development, uh, deployment, and utilization of health professionals at level of service of delivery platforms. Dr. Amir has inspired voluntarism uh, during his period in the ministry. He 
He has reached out and galvanized the medical diaspora to give back. And a hallmark of his tenure is that he has greatly increased visibility of multiple youth uh, and community-led initiatives that care for the weak and marginalized in the society, orphans, homeless, elderly, and young offenders. He has done so through weekly visits of the charities and uh, his regular social media posts, which are usually invitations to, to citizens to get behind similar initiatives in their locality that benefit the vulnerable uh, in society. He recently led and personally participated in a campaign to provide health care for the homeless in the capital city and plans to do the same in other parts of the country. In a recent interview uh, for a documentary on his professional journey, he describes his involvement in charities to be one of his passions. His younger sister, Peru Zaman, uh, she intimated, what amazes me is his deep sense of respect and dedication to others and the gratification he gets from helping others. One of his colleagues in the Ministry of Health, Ababayo Haile, said, in all his work, you can see that he lives for others, he pays attention to the forgotten, and often becomes the voice for the voiceless. Dr. Amir has received many recognition and accolades, including the WC Chancellor's Award for Outstanding Alumni for his role in implementing the country's health sector transformation plan by strengthening district health systems and improving quality of care, taking leadership <coughs> in regards to leading reforms of healthcare financing, human resource, health information, technology and infrastructure. During his tenure, human resource development has been a key strategic initiative that has resulted in significant increase in terms of enrollment, graduation, and deployment of health professional staff. For example, medical schools in Ethiopia increased from 13 to 32, and enrollment of medical students increased from less than 1,000 in 2010 to 3,100 per year. As a task-shifting approach, more than 400 integrated emergency surgical officers and 9,000 midwives having been trained to reduce the overwhelming maternal, prenatal, and infant mortality rates and trauma-related morbidities and mortalities. During his, his tenure, Dr. Amir also made significant contribution towards the recruitment, training, and deployment of an additional 9,000 health extension workers. The Ethiopia's Health Extension Program is an internationally recognized, innovative, homegrown, culturally and linguistically competent health service delivery platform. There is a widespread international consensus that health extension program has been instrumental significantly contributing toward Ethiopia meeting the MDGs and the provision of universal health care. Internationally, Dr. Oum Amir also serves as co-chair of the WHO's Transforming IHP Plus International Health Partnership for UHC 2013 which is dedicated to building a partnership to strengthening health systems and is a member of numerous related committees. He is also a board chair of CDC Africa, a board member of Gavi Vaccine Alliance as well. Dr. Amir is an inspiration to the youth and the country. His work demonstrates that powered with education and commitment to public service, youth can be a powerful force and the, transform, the transformation of their countries. And so UWC and the School of Public Health are enormously proud to not only be associated with such an inspirational and recognized visionary and leader in health system development in Africa, but to indeed feel that we have made a small contribution to his vision and, and leadership. And it's a great privilege to be told this, the 2018 Jax Harwell Award on the Honorable Minister of Health of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia and UWC Ali Manar and the SOPH, Dr. Amir Mahakos. Congratulations. Thanks, Warren. We made this introduction a bit longer because 
knowing Amir, we knew that he won't talk about his personal journey and his personal achievements, so we thought we'd at least need to let you know <laughs> who he is. So now, without further ado, from the man himself, um, the 2018 recipient of the Jake's Herald Award, Dr. Amir Aman. Thank you, Sklof. I'd like to thank Sklof Public Health, Tax Family and Foundation for this important hour and also for arranging this panel discussion. And Professor Uta in the World Day for organizing everything and you know, we have uh, communicating for the last one, one year almost in six months. And I'm really sorry that I didn't meet it on September. There was some incident that's happening at that time that I should be home. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming on this uh, Friday afternoon. I have that very difficult time on Friday afternoon in South Africa, but uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> I'll be trying to be very brief on my presentations, focused on our journey for the last 20 years, starting from the English era in 1990 to up to now. So the outline is I'll talk a little bit about the country background, especially the social demographic backgrounds of the country and how we make evidence-based decision-making the planning process for the last 20 years. Then I'll talk about the energy areas and finally how we are doing in the city area, especially for the last three years. The energy area focused on from 1990 to 2015, so it's almost a 15 years journey. And the SDG area is the one that we are doing right now. Our health sector transformation plan at the SDG area is three years old, and we are still two years to achieve most of the targets that we set. As a background, I know most of you know about Ethiopia, but just to give you a little bit of uh, the topographic difference that we have, uh, all around 60% of uh, tall mountains, hills in Africa is found in Ethiopia. I know some of you are surprised to hear that. So we have the tallest mountain, Mount with 4,500 meters, and we also have the lowest depression in the world. That's 200 meters below uh, sea level. We can see active volcano, the one that's there, the northwest part of Ethiopia. So the topographic difference is very wide. We have the uh, tallest mountain with 4,500 meters and the, the lowest uh, with uh, 200 meters below sea level. So you can imagine also the public health significance of this variable uh, the topography in the country. We also we are not only diverse on topographically, but also on ethnic basis. We are very diverse. We have more than 80 language and ethnic groups. So I say 880, it's not 80, so you can imagine also how diverse we are on ethnicity and uh, so religion and other uh, spectrum of topography and the social demographic aspect. And with a population of projection 99 million, we are doing census right now, so we are expecting 100 plus million population. And more than 78 percent, around 78 million of the population are young, aged, less than 35 years old. So you can say that ancient country with you know, young population. A uh, country with more than 3,000 years of history is a population of 78 million less than 35 years old. So the topography, the demographic, the social demographic transition is you know, taking long, but still 78% of our uh, population is young. So we have to really focus on demographic dividend and other aspects of uh, social uh, aspects. And as a government, we follow federal parliament system. We have nine regions and to city administration. The economy is still where low income countries we are aspired to reach low middle income countries by 2025 with a total uh, GDP of $80.6 It was uh, $8 billion 16 years back. We just beat Kenya last year on GDP and we become you know, the largest GDP in East Africa. Per <laughs> capita is low because you know, we are double the population of Kenya than the Kenya GDP is 79 billion, and Ethiopia is 8 billion just last year. Mm -hmm. On health, still we are on triple this burden. Uh, I can say that we achieved and we did a lot on preventing non communicable diseases. You can see that the sharp fall of a communicable disease from here to there. And interesting things happened at 2006. 
that the communicable disease, the non communicable disease, it's communicable disease on the top, high morbidity and mortality in the country. So we did one study on non communicable disease and injury. In 2016, 52% of cause of mortality in Ethiopia right now is caused because of non communicable disease and injury. And 70% of the morbidity is also due to non communicable disease and injury. So we are focusing on communicable disease, but we really have to rethink and redesign how we can also tackle the communicable, non communicable disease and also injuries for the future. That's why we initiated CAR 3 day just mm -hmm. last week, so that you know, people have an advocacy and to know about how they can beat uh, non communicable disease. And we made all screening free at that time for diabetics, hypertension, and also mammography for breast cancer and others, so that we can promote healthy life for non communicable disease in the country. Uh, the evidence-based decision-making process. We have a health, sorry. we have a health policy that's uh, around developed 21 years back, and we are trying to develop a new one. But our health policy is the one that's a center a core for all strategies that we developed for the last 20 years. From our health policy, uh, we have developed 20 years health sector development plan at the time of MDG, and beginning exercise at the time of SDG. And from our sector development plan, we uh, you know, disaggregate into five years a sector development plan, one, two, three, four, for every five years for the last 20 years until 2015. And on 2016, we developed a sector transformation plan one. It's on a CDG area, it's a new plan that we are implementing right now. That has three years old, it's still have two years to go. So that's how we do our yearly plan based on the sector development plan earlier and health sector transformation plan right now. And the whole planning process, we follow one plan, one budget, one report based on the HP uh, compact and the HP uh, advocacy. And we call it top down to bottom up approach. As a ministerial level, we develop some kind of core plans and we'll just uh, send to the lowest administration unit in court district, Warada. And we can also do some kind of comprehensive plan from bottom up. So it's just like top-down and bottom-up approach of planning. And on one budget, I think I can say that from Africa, it's one of the successful one budget programs that we have. We have three kind of channels for the budget. Channel one is the government, you know, the tax page, the tax that we collect from the people, that's channel one, and it's directly aligned with the government health plan. And channel three is the one that donors are put into the ministry, and we have one basket fund, we call it MDG Pool Fund earlier, and now it's MDG Pool Fund. It was started at the time of Dr. Tedros, and there was only one uh, uh, government partners defeat at that time of uh, the establishment. It was only $10 million per year at that time. Now we have 11 partners, and the total amount of money per year reached $120 million, and this year it's $160 million. So that's directly aligned with the government financial systems. There's no Dependent report, there's no dependent audit, it's directly aligned with the country one budget one report systems. And the reporting system we are using, we are using health management information system. Now we roll out to strict health management information systems to almost roll out all over the country. So one plan, one budget, one report, it's really working in the country. Still we have challenges, but I can say that it's in much better shape than we were 10 years back. There were a lot of parallel systems, you know, every partners will come and they'll just give you all their own uh, specific area, vertical programs, vertical audit, vertical uh, information system, and our health extension workers were you know, very overwhelmed because they have to report, like, more than they work, they spend much time on reporting and developing a report for that aspect. And now we manage to that. We have one plan, one budget, and one report all over the nation. And when we uh, do this decision making, we have different kinds of forum. Executive committee is the one that the ministers and the agency directors are meet every two weeks so that they can set the tone for the whole country's priorities and also to uh, discuss about the performance. And we have joint string committee. That's, uh, the, this forum is with regions. We have nine regions and two city administration. So the head of the regional health bureau heads of each region and city administration will sit with us every two months to discuss about our achievement and also challenges and the way forward. And we have joint consultative forum with all uh, the, the all partners, government partners, so that we can meet every quarter to set the tone for the whole country.
country priorities and other technical meetings. So our policy and practice during the MLG area is focused on how we can make equitable and acceptable standard, and it's guided on self-reliance. We are trying our best to rely on finance. Uh, in our uh, national health account, uh, five, it was done around eight years back. The total amount of, uh, the total share of the government from the total health expenditure was only 29%. And the one that we did last, the national health account six, it's grown from 29 to 50%. And we are expecting to become more on any seven that we are doing right now. So the government share is growing very fast, but still we are not reaching out with our declaration. And you know, still we are struggling to make sure that we have enough money to undertake the programs. And we have many exempted services and special assistance for the poor one. And our HRH strategy is mostly focused on community-based task oriented training and structure. The famous has extension programs, I know all of you know about that, but just to mention, right now we have more than 40,000 community health workers, we call them as extension workers, all over the countries, two per each village or cavalry, that's a population of around 5,000 population. And it's launched on 2003, the time Dr. Tedros was the minister and it's brought simple, cost-effective, locally desired as intervention close to where the country majority rural citizens are living in. Because 80% of the population is still in Ethiopia is living in rural areas. So this is how we try to reach the whole uh, population. And I can say that all the achievements of MBDG is, you can give a credit, maybe 80 or 90% of the credit is to our health extension workers. Maybe 10% to the physician. Most of the most of the time when I spoke like that, the physician is very angry, but I, I really can be honest. I can say that the achievements of all energies are because of our health extension programs. So what was the impact success for energy area? That's from 1990 to 2015. Ethiopia achieved all energy goals that set for health. We managed to reduce uh, maternal mortality by three-fourths. And we managed to reduce child mortality by two thirds, even two years before the MLG uh, time. And uh, on communicable disease, we managed to reduce uh, malaria morta mortality by 67% and morbidity by 47%. And there was no any malaria epidemic for the last six years. And we managed to reduce new HIV infection by 90% and minimize HIV prevalence from 5.8 to 0.19. And we, we launched HIV impact assessment just a week back in Ethiopia become the first country from Sub-Saharan Africa to become free from epidemic of HIV with a prevalence of 0 0.9. And we managed to reduce tuberculosis, morbidity, and mortality by 50%. And finally, the life expectancy is from 48 to 64 within 15 years. So every year, we add one year life expectancy. And it's uh, out of African average of 58. Almost six years left to become a global average of 70. So we are, we are, we are uh, due to all the social, worker, economic, and political situation, the life expectancy is also limited. And the major reason is due to underpriced mortality reduction and impact mortality reduction. In our new health sector uh, transformation plan, the one that we are implementing right now, it's come from the envisioning exercise that we did three years back with a vision of to, have, to see healthy, productive, and prosperous Ethiopians, and with a mission to use preventive promotion, creative and rehabilitation at the highest level with high quality. And the strategy plan is much focused on different characteristics like quality, equity, universal health coverage through PHC, efficiency and effectiveness, and I'll talk about the transformation agenda. And my favorite subject, the fourth transformation agenda we are trying to implement um, this year for the last three years, and we are also planning to do it for the coming year. And our management house is built with four pillars, excellence in service delivery, excellence in improvements of uh, assurance and quality assurance, excellence in leadership and governance, and excellence in health system capacity. This is how we build our five, health sector, five years health sector transformation plan. It's a little bit messy, but uh, this is how our 15 strategic objectives are set in. It's based on the, the four perspective of balanced scorecard, 
you have capacity building perspective, internal process perspective, finance and community perspective. So we have 15 strategic objectives. The final one is to see improved health status of our community. So we have targets for each strategic objectives and that's directly aligned with SDG targets and to achieve UHC, safety UHC. From 15 strategic objectives, we choose four of the most important one and we call them transformation agenda, health sector transformation agenda. The one that we want to see after five years of you know, the implementation time of health sector transformation plan, really want to transform these four important uh, targets. The first one is quality and equity. The second one, information revolution. Third, world transformation. And finally, how we can make our health professional compassionate, caring, and respectful to the patient. The quality and equity. Uh, we, by inspiring by Hans Rosening, we try to do some kinds of the same kind of statistical assessment as for different regions in Turkey. We have four regions, pastoralist and four agrarian in Ethiopia and Sudan. And the difference between the pastoralist and the agrarian region is 30 years, 3 zero. So our pastoralist region, any children who are born in pastoralist region have the same kinds of services that 30 years before the agrarian children are getting. So you can see the inequalities, differences that's happening in the countries. There's a 30 years difference in equals health services and other targets. So we really want to minimize that cost. And we, that's why we put equity as one of the priority transformation agenda for the sector. And quality is obvious reasons. Even though we have done so much on increasing access, still the quality is very minimal. So we are trying to minimize that gap by implementing different kinds of quality improvement and equity through improvement plans. The second one is information revolution. One of the big challenges is we are lying all information from top to down. Still, we are challenging with inaccurate. I can be honest with you, false reports. It's very tough. You know, all the reports that we get in from administration data compared with uh, any kind of census or any kind of survey, the difference is more than 80%. So it's very tough to decide based on the data that we are using. So we really want to transform and revolutionize the whole information system in the country. So most of the time, uh, our health professionals, they collect data for the purpose of reporting, not to do evidence-based decision-making as a side of foundation. So we want to change that attitude. It's very tough. So the first plan that we are trying to implement for the last three years, and we continue to do that, is data use culture. It's very tough. Still, we are struggling. We are trying to do study why false report or you know, reporting false data is not as painful as you know as a mother who was dying because of that decision making as the children or any citizens of Ethiopia. So we are trying to use different kind of study, anthropological, sociology, and other studies we are coming up with different strategies to change the culture data of the data culture of the country. And the second one is very easy, digitalization. Now we are digitalizing sixty percent so the whole health post, health centers and hospitals that we have. And we are using electronic community information systems, electronic uh, uh, management information systems, and others. So it's very easy. You just pay to the state on digital telephone, and they just did you know, everything. Because if you can pay, it's very easy one. And the hardest one is how we can make data is culture. In fact, digitalization might be bad even from the manner one. If you digitalize the whole country without changing the culture, you'll get false report very fast and you decide very fast and it might be you know, more dangerous than getting using manual data systems. And the last one is how we can strengthen the governance systems of the information revolution. And the third transformation agenda is order transformation, that's uh, district transformation. And in Ethiopia we have more than 834 districts all over the country. So we really want to transform that district, to transform the region in Zantra to see the transform in Ethiopia. And it has three major Areas. We are working on to have a highly effective primary health care unit. The primary health care unit in our setup is like five health posts, one health center, five health center, five, 25 health posts, and one district hospital. We call it the highly uh, primary health care unit. So we really want to do more to have highly performing primary health care unit. We have health insurance, community based health insurance scheme. That's an uh, informal insurance scheme for the one who don't have payroll based salary and they're just the informal workers and right now 20 million Ethiopians are insured through this community-based insurance. 
that's around 300 districts are covered, and we are planning to make it you know, 600 this year and 800 next year. And finally, to create model villages. We, you know, we invested a lot for the last 15 years to create model houses. Now it's a time to shift to model villages. We can't, we can't keep on going, making model household and then they'll go back after two, three years and go back into form. So we really want to graduate the whole model village in this period. Finally, how we can link our the whole process with uh, SDG plans and universal health coverage. So through envisioning exercise, now we are revising the health policy. It's almost finalizing, and the health policy, the health sector transformation plan is derived from the envisioning exercise and the health policy that will help us to achieve the whole UHCs in all three dimensions of its boxes. And we are also advising our essential health service package and it will be finalized with enablements. So by doing all the things that I mentioned, we are optimistic and we are hoping that we will achieve all SDG goals within the time frame that's targeted. And thank you for listening. <laughs>
So we don't have that much problems on vertical programs, but still we are challenging to give quality. Quality is our major issues. Quality health services, quality drugs, quality medical equipment, quality of buildings, quality of our health professional is a big challenge to go to universal health coverage through the HC. So that's why we, are, we make quality as one of the major transformation agenda. And we established one institute in Addis. It's called International Primary Care Institute. And uh, David Sanders is a member of board. And the former minister, Dr. Cassette, is the chair of the board. We really tried our best to give what we have to other African countries and at the same time to learn from them how they can integrate primary health care into their systems and how they can use community health workers and health extension programs for their uh, health systems as well. And we got ma many interest from different countries. Right now, 11 countries already uh, show their interest, and we are trying to support them through this institute. So I can say that to go to EHC through EHC is not a new concept. It was there in paper for the last 30 years, 40 years. We already celebrated a matter declaration last year, last um, uh, two, three months back. But I can say that Ethiopia can be a model to show that UHC through UHC can be possible and can really help us to increase the capacity in the system of the nation. Still, the quality is an issue that we have to Thank you. Thank you, Mir. That was really inspirational. And I think the platform that you've shown that we can improve and the community health workers make a, have made a huge impact. In Ethiopia, are the community health workers, um, how are they supported in terms of capacity building as well as the re remunerated? Are they remunerated or are they voluntary? They are all remunerated and they are the government's uh, civil servants. So we recruit them from grade 10 and we give great training of two years to graduate at level three in our uh, technical and vocational education systems and level certificates. So there was the level three earlier, now they are graduated to level four. So after a year, they have become level five and almost as the same as degree programs as in the country. So all are civil servants and all are in payrolls. So that's how we maintain and sustain the programs. But still, the amount of money that we are paying is very low. It's uh, the lowest in Africa. The uh, national average of uh, uh, money spent, the government money spent on civil servants in sub-Saharan Africa is around 30%. Ethiopia still is 8%. It's only 8% of the whole uh, government expenditure goes to the salary of civil servants. So the salary is low for health extension workers and also for physicians, but still they are part of the civil servant. And the training, we give different kinds of training. And one of the integrations that we did was also on training. There are a lot of trains, like trains on TB, I mean, CI trains on malaria, and things like that. So eight years back, we said that enough. Let us have one uh, uh, refreshment trainings just twice per year. So every partners, every uh, gaps will be, you know, gathered and they'll talk and they'll come up with one refreshment training, two refreshment training per year, so that we can give them all the gaps that they have and that's supported by different donors. So we even don't allow donors to directly contact our community health workers. They can only work up to the health center because we don't want to become an arrogant, but we saw challenges, like they will just go to the communities, went to the communities workers, and they will tell them that if you work on this specific issue, we'll give you targets, different kinds of uh, incentives, and maybe some pocket money. And that has big negative impact on the system. So eight years, that's almost eight years, uh, any NGOs, they can't go in direct contact with our communities workers. They only stay up. It's only the government workers that they can go and communicate with our community as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the very inspiring presentation. Uh, I quickly browse through the documents, uh, uh, this health sector transformation plan, and uh, I found uh, more than ten, 10 times about uh, accountability, improving accountability and uh, transparency but also reducing avoidable inequality. Can you comment on that, please? Uh, yes, to increase the uh, accountability of the country, we uh, come up with one innovative idea. We call it community scorecard. 
Uh, this community scorecard is implemented in 300 districts. It's around 30-40% uh, of the whole district that we have. On community scorecard, the communities will evaluate each other's posts, each other's centers, and each district hospitals in Manzili manner. We have one uh, big move, second to the assassination programs, we develop health development army. This health development army is a concept that each six uh, neighboring uh, household will have, you know, create a network, we call it one to five network. And the one that a model household will lead the whole network and they will talk about you know taking care of children and how they can improve the household health and also, also maternal health and others when they are sitting, fishing waters and also doing different kinds of ceremonies. So this uh, one to five network and that development army is the one who evaluate each health post, each health centers and mentally manner and every quarter, the whole town hall meeting each has a post result will be uh, discussed. And that's how we increase our accountability framework. And we can see huge difference between districts who implement uh, community scorecard versus districts who didn't implement the business business scorecard. This is how we are you know, moving on accountability issues. And inequalities. For the last three years, uh, we managed to minimize the inequalities by 10%. <laughs> but our plan is to make by 50%. It should be, by now, it should be, the inequality should be minimized by 50%. But due to the transition and you know, for the last two and a half years, it was not a good time for Ethiopia. There was a lot of many conflict here and there. And there, it's very difficult to do the normal activities. And all of our time was occupied by emergency response. So that's the main reason, but we can't just sit down and say that you know, we have a reason and do not achieve this target. So that's why for the coming one year and a half, one, in six, one year and six months, we really work very hard to compensate what we missed for the last three years and to achieve this 50% difference minimizing the inequalities between pastoralists and agrarian cities and rural and between the service utilization between men and women. And there are different kinds of inequalities that we already managed in and what we want to minimize that. Thank you. Okay. Um, my question concerning youth work centers. Uh, I just want to, we all know that corruption has always been the, you know, one of the obstacles uh, in impacting a uh, health yeah, system. Um, in Ethiopia, what is, the, what is the case, or how is corruption level in Ethiopia, and how is it, is it impacting on you know, health system, or, and what are you doing about that? That's why we are living in Africa, so corruption is everywhere. And I can't, I can't say that they are not different from uh, the world. But still, uh, it's, it's not as big uh, challenge, especially in other sectors, uh, especially on um, financial values. You know, we didn't see up to now big corruptions from the financial perspective. But still, we have corruption on counterfeit have corruption on health workers that they use much of their time to work on private clinics than working in the government sector. We have still corruption on low standard building of health facilities. We are still struggling of corruption of different dimensions. Even though we didn't have much drunk corruption on financial monetary value, we're still trying to tackle different kinds of corruption all over the country. So that's still a challenge. And uh, we are, there are different mechanisms that we have, the government try to minimize the corruption. And uh, our new prime minister, he always said that unless otherwise we change our attitude about the anti-corruption, we have anti-corruption organization. He always said that we have to change the name. You know, we don't have uh, anti-disease ministry. We have health ministry. <laughs> we don't have anti-illiterate ministry. We have education ministry. So we don't have to wait for people to become illiterate. We will teach them you know, before they become illiterate. We'll not wait for people to become you know, diseased and ill. We just want to help them to prevent some issues. So even the name, anti-corruption, is the one that we have to wait until the corruption is not happening, and we work on to minimize the corruption. So there are such kinds of views so that we can work on our users, our children, to minimize corruption. And I'm hoping that it becomes inspirational to change the whole corruption system in Africa. Wondering whether, since we have you here, it's a unique opportunity whether you will spend two, three minutes to talk to us about what's going on right now around the country, because we 
don't get a huge amount of information in South Africa. Um, I mean, there's Al Jazeera and so on, there's bits and pieces, but I think it would be really great to just be in a nutshell, what is this about? What's the new prime minister's vision? What are the key challenges? Um, okay, thank you. Uh, the, this biggest vision of the coming two years, I can't say it's two years, is to establish the United uh, State of Form of Africa. So he's planning to add Somali, Djibouti, Ethiopia, and Eritrea and to establish one United States of Form of Africa. That's his vision, that's his inspiration, that's what he really tried to do. So that's why he uh, has uh, no war, no, no, no peace so his aircraft came to the case. And now he's working very hard to establish a very good relationship with Somalia and also to Djibouti, of course. We had a very good relationship with Djibouti, but now the price is coming and we have a little bit tense because we are using the Djibouti port for the last 20 years. Now the price is coming and we are also planning to use air transport. So there are also some tension, but he's really managing the whole situation. He's trying to manage the situation in Horn of Africa. So he really believes that unless otherwise, we come up and you know, establish a big countries or a big federation or confederation, we can't move on like that. So that's his big needs and for the whole of Africa. Inside for the country, he really begin to have uh, democratic transitions in Ethiopia. It might be our first time to have a transition without, you know, in the of civil war. So he's trying his best and he really believe on women empowerment. That's why he made 50% his cabinet, the ministry is a woman. And also the president for the first time, we have a woman president right now, and woman defense minister. It might be the first in Africa to have woman defense minister, so that you know, we can minimize wars in the, in the, in the regions. <laughs> and we have woman minister of peace, and you know, the whole woman ministry of position is a high position in the country. So when he said, when he talked about love, compassion, unity, I can't say, you know, I know him for the last uh, nine years because uh, there was a place that I uh, assigned at the time of immediately after medical graduation is a uh, hometown of you know, our prime minister. So we knew each other because I was, work, I was working in the district hospital. So for the last nine years, he always said the same. You know, no change, peace, unity, love, and he was going to establish one big nation so on the whole. So I can say that his integrity, consistency, and to establish a peaceful transition is tremendous. That's how we are in end. But uh, we are right now, but uh, the transition is not as smooth as we can. It's rough. And uh, we have around uh, 3 million internal displaced population, close 8 million, it's nice to 3 million. And we have some kinds of conflict here and is able to different ethnicity uh, tribe uh, conflicts. And so we are there's so much to be done that I can say that he is, he is, as a minister, the whole cabinet, we can't even hold our breath to catch up with him. You know, he's worked 24 hours, seven, so it's very fast. He, just as uh, one uh, tips, he wants to change the whole palace to become a zoom and a correct. His own palace. It was a palace for Imperial Benedict, it was a palace for Imperial Harris and Dase, and during the military death regime, and also it was a palace that the late Prime Minister and I think also the, uh, the Prime Minister Hanamari was living in. So he just only secured some plot of the land and he planned to make all the place to become a park, zoo, and aquarium for children. Mm -hmm. And uh, he really wanted to become self reliant that he'll use that money for the palace expenditure and others. So he's planning to open this after six months. So all are invited to see <laughs> yeah, Imperial Minidic Palace, and it's also a few that. You are planning to marry, you know, in a very short period of time. <laughs> There's a immediately call to be, you know, rented and to have a very, very, very historical and cultural extension. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
So it's really my, <coughs> my privilege and honor to, to give a vote of thanks. Um, you know, at UWC, Diana, we've had many outstanding um, students and graduates. And there are many now who have long bypassed me and have become very prominent on the world stage. And as uh, Amir mentioned, I'm a member of a board, um, a board of an institute of international primary health care, and so he is very much my boss. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm not going to add anything except to say that the last board meeting was deliberately held in one of the regions, in Tigray. And I believe that's also an area where there are quite a lot, uh, a lot of displaced people at the moment. And um, very excitingly, we were taken out by the regional director to actually look at the primary health care system. So what Amir hasn't gone into detail about, and I hope I'm not wrong, is that although there are two health extension workers, community health workers, for a population of 5,000, kind of similar to what we're planning in South Africa. There's one very important difference, and that is that below these health extension workers, there are many workers called the Health Development Army, and below them, the Women's Development Army. So, there are at least two tiers of community-based workers, possibly even three. And there is a facility below the health center called the health post. And I think there are five health posts to one health center. So these are things that are not really engaged with in our country. We are going to have two community health workers for about 5,000 people, but we are not going to have to fight for that, that community-based infrastructure which seems to me to be absolutely key to the kinds of um, initiatives and the progress that has been made. And, and finally, and I've got some great photos. We were shown by two health extension workers um, what they were doing. And their information system was posters on the wall, as I think you showed in one of your slides. And they knew exactly what was going on in every single household that they were covering. So, we have computer-based systems in South Africa, but I don't think that we have the knowledge seems to me to be absolutely central. So it's quite inspirational. Thank you very much for giving us a glimpse. I hope you can encourage our health minister <laughs> and some of the senior policy makers to spend just a few days in Tigray. Because I think they don't know what they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I now have the pleasure of thanking people who made today possible. Um, of course, again, to the Malboga Foundation for making this possible, uh, as you do each year. And in particular, also to our administrative staff, who behind the scenes do a great deal of work to make today possible, in particular, Tammy Peterson and Carnita Ernest, who have been burrowing away and making sure that today happened, even though it is the beginning of the holidays. And finally, to her family, thank you very much for being here, and please wish Phoebe the best, and and thanks to everyone here coming today. I'm sure you'll agree it was well worth it. And we invite you 